All right, uh, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about some of the events that have led us into World War II, uh, some of the causes, if you will, of World War II. Uh, one of the very first causes is really the attitude of our own government and of governments around the world following World War I. After World War I, nations were desperate to stay out of war. It was such a terrible war. The costs were so immense, both monetarily and in human life, that really countries wanted to stay out of war. Well, well how does that lead us into a war then? Well, we signed what's called the Kellogg-Briand Pact, January 15, 1929, and it basically outlaws war. Everybody who uh, signed on said, that well, we won't attack anybody else. But there's really no way of enforcing that, and it does allow for defensive war. In other words, if somebody attacks you, you can obviously defend yourself. And so what were you going to do if somebody decided they were going to attack everybody? How are you going to stop them from attacking everybody other than fighting a war, which is what you were supposed to outlaw in the first place? Um, and so really, it's unenforceable. But nonetheless, there was such a huge desire to prevent it that countries were willing to do almost anything uh, to stay out of World War II. And, and it's that desire that in some strange roundabout way leads them into World War II. Uh, depression then. The Depression itself was another cause of World War II. People, uh, as a result of the Great Depression, were willing to listen to leaders who otherwise they might not have been willing to listen to. Because when you're desperate, when you're when you're in need of somebody to save you, if somebody steps up and says, hey, I'll save you, you listen. And that's what Adolf Hitler did with, with Germany. That's uh, what the leaders of Japan did with Japan. That's what Mussolini did. Um, and in the United States, you know, would we have been willing to follow Franklin Delano Roosevelt over a cliff? Probably. Uh, just thankfully, he wasn't quite as nuts as Adolf Hitler was. And so certainly the Depression really sets the stage for the rise of leaders such as Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini, who end up drawing us into World War II. Uh, also, again, with this desire to stay out of war, you have aggression that goes continually unchecked uh, all throughout the 1930s. Japan, as early as September of 1931, invades uh, Manchukuo, which was a province of China at the time, but it was uh, claimed as a sphere of influence by both Russia and Japan. Uh, Japan goes ahead and sets up a, a pretense, it was a trumped up charge, uh, to go ahead and invade uh, Manchuria. And so they go ahead and they do and they set up a puppet state, a state that which they can control, called Manchukuo. Uh, this leads to the Stimson Doctrine, which states that the United States would not recognize any territorial gains made by force. So in other words, we basically told Japan, hey, you took over Manchuria, but we're not going to say that you took over Manchuria because we don't like how you took it over. So we don't really think that you did, even though you really did, and your soldiers are there. It really wasn't a strong enough response, and it really led to an action. So what Japan and Germany and other countries took from that is that, okay, if we take stuff over, we'll get a stern scolding from the United States and other countries like the U.S., but they're not really going to do anything to us for doing this. Uh, and this leads, again, to further aggression. Uh, Japan, as a result, pulls out of the League of Nations and said, fine, if you don't like the way we play the game, we won't play your game. See you later. And they leave the League. Uh, also, another example of unchecked aggression is Italy invading Ethiopia. Mussolini uh, goes ahead and says, hey, uh, that there were some, uh, some uh, Ethiopians who were threatening some uh, Italian interests, and it's, it's actually false, uh, just like in the case of, uh, of Japan. Uh, but nonetheless, they go ahead and the Italians invade Ethiopia, and they conquer Ethiopia. Uh, it wasn't really a fair fight. The Ethiopians using pretty primitive weapons, the Italians using airplanes and bombs. Germany also pulls out of the League of Nations in a similar uh, type of scenario. Uh, according to the Treaty of Versailles, they weren't supposed to go ahead and put military forces in an area along the Rhine River. That's the border between France and Germany, called the Rhineland. Well, in 1936, Adolf Hitler come, had come to power by this point. And he tells the Germans, who are these other countries to tell us where we can put our soldiers in our own country? The Rhineland is part of Germany. And the Germans were like, yeah, that's right. And, and so uh, Adolf Hitler goes ahead and moves Army, armed forces into the Rhineland and dares the Europeans to do anything about it, and the Europeans uh, do nothing. Um, and this is really a policy that becomes known as appeasement. Look, okay, you know, that's that's a pretty reasonable request. You should be able to do with your own army what you want in your own country. That's not terrible, so we'll let him do that, and, and maybe that'll be enough. Maybe he'll set, be satisfied. Maybe he will be appeased. The problem is that only leads to further aggression, because they said, okay, fine, you're not going to enforce that. Well, what will you enforce? How far can I go? It's almost like you're dealing with a two- or a three-year-old who's pushing the, the limits of their parents' rules. How far? You told me not to run, but what about skipping? Can I do that? Okay, you're not going to do anything about skipping? Well, maybe I go a little further next time. How far are you willing to go? And that's what Germany, Italy, and Japan are doing. And the rest of the world is basically saying, well, we'll do nothing. Uh, another uh, factor that leads us into World War II 
is the rise of a new form of government, a new governmental system called fascism. It's the idea that the state is more important than the individual and it has a, usually a, a strong centralized government that's what binds all the individual citizens together and it's usually ruled by a dictator. The government is in control of everything. It's a totalitarian regime. Uh, and if you don't like that, then the government will come and track you down and they will make sure that you either A, do not say anything else because you'll be dead or you'll be in prison. Uh, and so they suppress op opposition using force. The guy who comes up with this system and who gives it to this name is Benito Mussolini, the ruler of Italy. He's nicknamed Il Duce, uh, and his group that goes around oppressing people are called the Black Shirts. Uh, and, and almost every every fascist organization, Hitler certainly had it with his Gestapo and his Brown Shirts, uh, but they had a group that went around and enforced uh, their own particular political philosophies, their own particular political agenda, and silenced dissent. Uh, Mussolini's goal is he wants to restore Roman glory. He wants to make the Mediterranean uh, in his words, a Roman lake. That's what the Romans used to call it. This is our lake, the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, and he's looking to restore that type of that type of glory to Italy, to Rome. Adolf Hitler, then. Uh, when you're talking about events leading into Adolf Hitler, or to World War II, you've got to mention Adolf Hitler. Uh, leader of the Nazi party. Uh, he, he really learns how to govern from watching Mussolini. He, he goes ahead and is elected uh, to uh, chancellor in Germany. And he's like, okay, what do I do with this now? Well, he looks to the example that Mussolini gave. Uh, and we all, you know, look around and like, how did Adolf Hitler come to power? Didn't we know? Well, yeah, we did know. Adolf Hitler told us everything he wanted to do. He writes it down in a, in a book called Mein Kampf. You can still go purchase it today at a bookstore. Uh, translation, that means my struggle uh, is what he talks about. And so he lays out his vision for Germany. Uh, and he adds additional things into fascism. Uh, Mussolini just wanted complete control to restore Roman glory. Uh, Adolf Hitler goes ahead and adds hatred and discrimination to that. that uh, not only does he want German glory, but he's going to achieve German glory by getting rid of those things that are uh, counter to it, i.e. certain groups, like, for instance, Jewish people. Uh, and so he adds that in. That was not really a component of fascism under Mussolini, uh, but it's certainly become a component of fascism that we, we commonly associate with the, with the term today.